She was just wondering, you're traveling the world. How is it to travel around and no, no matter where you go, everybody knows the brand Apple? It must be like uh, it's, Well, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of honored. Um, you know, it's something that we always hoped that we would be a big company, well-known worldwide, you know, and we kind of felt we did. We felt we had a great product, but um, it's ex it exceeded what we could have thought of back then. Remember, when we started Apple, the amount of memory to hold a song cost about a million dollars. So you can't envision everything. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, how would you describe the world we live in right now, Steve, when it comes to disruption? The world right now is everywhere I go, everyone acknowledges it's changing faster than it ever has in our life. When I was young, I was told about a lot of change from the prior generations that we'd gone through, but I'll tell you, it was slow, slow change for a long, long time. And now with the digital revolution, and the cell phones, and the mobile internet, and the high bandwidth, everything that was unimaginable so long ago. It's, that's what's disruptive about it, is people who are still alive grew up with one way of doing things, of getting through life, of doing the things you want to do, and now it's a whole different way you do it. And uh, I, you know, even a computer geek like myself used to understand everything computers could do. Nowadays, any geek is somebody who can actually just use their, their phone and use all the apps right, and you know, my grandmother can use, <laughs> do it better than me almost. Earlier today, we, we had, um, had a presentation where we just touched a bit upon AI. And I know when we speak about AI, you and Steve Hawkins and Elon Musk have, you are among those who have raised concern about artificial intelligence uh, and the way it could change our lives. They, this, this presents opportunities, but also threats in somehow. How should we embrace artificial intelligence in your opinion? I was raising concerns about artificial intelligence actually a couple of years before the others on stage over and over, but with, I always like to explain my reasoning. And my reasoning was that computers to computers do all the financial transactions of the world because a slow human costs money. What if the computers replaced our brains like they're replacing knowledge of the world? It's out, the knowledge is out there on the internet. You do a Google search and you get more than you get from a bright person's brain. What if they replace the smart people that run companies? What if a company opens up across the street from Apple and uses no slow humans? Keeps the slow humans out of the loop and only has machines. Will they perform better economically? Oh my gosh, what that, would, what that would mean is economics always wins. But then I backed off and decided that really won't happen, that we are totally in control of what devices we're making today at the point of singularity. Theoretically, the machines have independent thought and they can think for themselves and they can program for themselves and choose what they're gonna do and make themselves better. But they're still going to need a lot of things like replicating their species, which involves humans, you know, from machines that dig, dig ores in the quarries and things like that. They're never gonna really take over the world. Um, I, do, I did come around to a more positive thinking. Moore's law is gonna keep them from getting ultimately smart in a lot of ways that are humans are smart, especially in the ways that you know other humans and you know the needs of other humans and how they'll respond to products that you make, they, um, they won't get that smart. But also, um, you know what, We'd been, we're going to grow up as friends, as a partnership. Humans are the gods creating them anyway, and if they ever got to that point of really thinking for themselves and having consciousness, they would say humans are our best friends and we have been created to take care of all the human needs. That's our prime directive. And that won't go away quickly. That, 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 that'll maybe stay forever and ever and millennia. So even if that happened in a couple hundred years that, oh, the computers decided they ran the world, they would still say we need these humans. They're, they're our best friends. No, just, like we, just like we do with our pet dogs. I feed my dogs filet steak after I got this idea because if I'm gonna be a pet someday, I'm gonna treat my <laughs> pets the way I wanna be treated. <laughs> Good point. We'll talk a bit about the future a bit later on in our conversation because I'd like to go to something very valuable, actually the world's most valuable brand, Apple. What does Apple mean to you, Steve? Well, of course, I'm very, very proud of it, but we set a tone when we started Apple, um, even though there were three of us and we didn't really have a company in a garage, um, not a full company. We didn't do any product definitions or engineering or designs or prototyping or manufacturing, and it was a very short term with a product that we knew was dead end anyway. Um, but two of us starting in a garage implies two people starting with no money. And that's true. We had no savings accounts, no rich relatives or anything. We, we just, basically that scrapping image caught in people's heads and it stood through time. And that's what people always want to root for. At, sometimes they want to root for the underdog. And it's really that image that drove us to the successful, uh, the success that we have today. 
So Steve, I'm, I'm wondering, do you get a bit emotional when I show you this picture, which is the uh, Apple I, which you singularly handled, developed in 1976? It was actually the computer that launched Apple, right? That was a computer that, I, I, I wouldn't say launched Apple. Steve Jobs didn't know that I had built it and designed it. I created it to show off to a computer club of Stanford professors and Berkeley professors who spoke of the social good when we had our own computers. We would educate and we would communicate and we, the geek would, would be important. And I built it and I gave away my design for free to everyone at the club. I passed it out on paper to everyone at the club. They had a design. I said, go build your own for $300, a useful computer that can solve problems you have at work. And um, Steve Jobs came along and saw it, and he saw the interest in it. And don't believe the movie that shows him taking me to a computer club. I was a hero at the club, showing my computer every two weeks. <laughs> but I hit, what it was was the Apple One, this Apple One was a formula one board full of chips, it was a small board actually then, it's full of chips hand wired by myself and it could do the full job of a computer where you could type in programs and get answers from them and it had enough memory. A lot of decisions in that were very different than what everyone else was trying. So, um, so it was the formula. Here's what a personal computer should be. It was given away for free. Everyone looking over my shoulders knew in, to start their companies, and this is how we're going to build computers. And that's what led to even other early personal computers. The Apple II was, was actually demonstrated before we ever shipped an Apple I computer. The Apple II was the product that would change the world, and we knew it because homes didn't want a computer. A computer was a big old mainframe in a company. It cost millions of dollars, and it did inventory and sales analysis and... Who would want that in a home? Games. People would want games. It had to be fun. I believed in fun. I had built games for Atari when they were hardware designs. The Apple II computer was the first time ever games were in color, arcade games were in color, and the first time ever that they were in software, where a nine-year-old kid could type, you know, vertical equals one, horizontal equals two, vertical equals three, and make things move on a screen at real speeds with simple commands. This was a, a huge change. So we knew the Apple II was the real product that would be a big company, be very successful. And a big company means, hey, if it makes us a million dollars, that's big, huge. Steve, as you said, the, uh, the story of, uh, behind Apple has fascinated the world in such an extent that it's Hollywood material. You just mentioned the movie. I'd just like to show a clip where um, the movie illustrates the discussion between you and Steve. Let's have a look. Yeah. I'm sorry to be blunt, but that happens to be the truth. The Lisa was a failure. The Macintosh was a failure. I don't like talking like this, but I am tired of being Ringo when I know I was John. Everybody loves Ringo. And I'm tired of being patronized by you. You think John became John by winning a raffle was? You think he tricked somebody or hit George Harrison over the head? He was John because he was John. He was John because he wrote Ticket to Ride. And I wrote the Apple II. Everybody, look, I want to clear Nobody the Nobody moves. You made a beautiful board, which, by the way, you're willing to give out for free, so don't tell me how you built Apple. If it weren't for me, you'd be the easiest day at Homestead High These School. These people live and die by your praise. So here's your chance. Acknowledge that something good happened that you weren't in the room for. No. Steve. No, he said here in the Hollywood movie. Sure. And everybody here is looking at you now, and we want to wonder how close to the truth is this <coughs> scene of, I, you, I and, think uh, of the, you and Jobs' partnership. The, the reasons in life and in the company and Steve Jobs and myself that are portrayed there probably are accurate and existed. Did I ever, I was such a soft person. I could never run a company, only be an engineer in the laboratory building hardware and software. I would never say anything um, bad to people like that, to a friend. I could never ever say something like that. I actually thought the Lisa was a, was a big successful move for humanity, you know, whether it made money for Apple or not. And that the, the Macintosh, even though it had crashed at first, was a big move. Steve's product, the next computer, because Steve was behind it, I thought it was gonna um, really influence the world and move us forward and everything like that. I never spoke to my friend Steve Jobs like that, um, you know, calling him names or, or saying he wasn't worth anything. No, not at all. Other people said those things. So it was just portrayed in the movie as me doing it. No, no, no. I was, I'm too soft and nice a guy. I just don't have any enemies. <laughs> and Steve and I were good friends right to the very end. Nobody ever saw us in an argument. So this was Hollywood really beating on. 
There, there is this question which is in the same alley. It says, what was your biggest disagreement with Steve Jobs? Well, we, we had so I, I wasn't a person to disagree. When we were going to produce the Apple II computer, it could have eight slots for other people, outsiders, to add things onto the computer. Steve said, you only need two slots, a modem and, and a, a printer because he had only worked once on a computer terminal. He'd never been near computers. He didn't understand them. He didn't know the hardware or the software in them. And he had worked on a computer where you typed in on a teletype and it was a printer and it went over, your data went over a modem to a time-sharing computer. And that's all he, he knew about. And I, said, I just said to him, well, um, if you want two slots, go get another computer. <laughs> my way or the highway, because I owned it all. I had developed the whole computer myself. It was just my ownership, the Apple II computer. So Steve, I'd just like to go back to, uh, to you and Jobs' relationship. As you said, this was over <coughs> saturated. I'm just thinking, Steve Jobs, he was kind of a myth, and he became you know, a bit of a guru for many people. But he's been called everything from a tyrant to a genius. How did you see him? Um, those are all very correct. Now, Steve was not like um, a good student in academics. Um, <coughs> and genius, though, was believing in himself, largely, believing that he had ways of thinking that could be made into reality, and a lot of times his limitations of knowledge of what computers were led us to the world that we have to this day. And that was a, it's a type of genius, it's hard to, hard to say, but once he got in control, he had ways of making sure every little detail of a product was right. He showed the Macintosh to Bill Gates, but he didn't show the iPhone to Bill Gates. And he made every little detail was right. Every time Steve came up with an idea in the company, change things just slightly, change a color. In the end, I always sat there and said, he's actually right. It's a tiny, tiny bit, unseen by most people, but it's a tiny bit better the way Steve does it, so he's the smartest man in the room. Um, as far as being a tyrant, it wasn't so much that he was a tyrant. It was things that you never see on YouTube. It was how he dealt with other people nastily ways and just you know fire somebody for no reason and, and do things that you'd say, how could a human being ever do that? Why, why does he have, he doesn't have to be that way. Um, a lot of us that were close to him saw those things. Some of them were portrayed in this movie, a little tiny bit of it. How but did there, was, there was an awful lot of that, and I would never raise a kid to be that way. I don't know how it happened. But how do you think he treated you and your friendship? Treated me per wonderfully. Um, Steve always respected good engineers in the company, people that had ideas, that created things, that really did good work for them, and he treated me the same way. He could even ask me questions over a phone, and I'd have a really sloppy, dumb answer, and he would just jump on somebody else and say, that's a bunch of crap. You know, he wouldn't do that to me. He was always, he treats you with respect if you're in a certain category. Plus, like I said, I was always, always nice to him. I never, never said anything bad or nasty to him. There were, you know, a couple incidences but where he did things, but not me. There's someone here who actually want to know, what is actually your connection to Apple today? My connection to Apple is I am the person who's been on the payroll every single week since we started the company. To this day, I'm the only person, and I get a small token salary, and Apple won't fire me. And, um, but I don't have any official ongoing work inside of Apple. Um, I'm, I, I speak to the company. I'm loyal to the company. But I'm also very honest on stage. Honesty overrides any of that. So I will answer every question, and I'll answer every question honestly. I will praise things in competitors' products, and I will sometimes sometimes cut Apple's, um, something they did down, usually if they changed something or took away something that I love to use. <laughs>